and to witness and to share the message of Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit then takes that message and by the power of God transforms lives. He does that. We don't do that. He does that. But he gives us the power to sow the seed of the word. To sow the seed of the word and be a witness and be a testimony of Jesus Christ. Part three, I talked to you about when less is more. Sometimes when God strips us down and prunes us back, we think he's destroying us when actually he's setting us up for more growth. He's setting us up for better things. We talked about Gideon and how the Lord had taken Gideon from out of the plow fields and had raised him up to be a judge and a deliverer and and how God had taken him and he had 32,000 soldiers with him. And God whittled him all the way down to 300. And Gideon's probably standing there thinking, God, what are you doing to me here? Have you ever had those moments when it feels like God is stripping you down and God is taking things away and he's cutting things off and you're walking through trials and you're thinking, God, what are you doing to me here? And yet Gideon believed God. And Gideon... And those 300 men went in and destroyed over 100,000 warriors simply with a trumpet and a pitcher and a lamp, a torch. They didn't even have to raise a sword because when they began to shout and break pictures and blow the pitchers and blow the trumpet, the enemy turned on itself and started killing each other. The nation of Israel didn't even have to raise a sword. God took the sword of the enemy to destroy the enemy. See, sometimes less is more. And so today I want to finish up with part four of just more. (laughs) Just more. In Philippians chapter four, verses 10, starting verse 10, look with me at what the word of God says. It says, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but only you. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. I want to speak to you about just more. How many of you would say, I just want more? I'm not talking about more of this world stuff or goods or money. Well, money. No, I'm just kidding. But we, I just want more. God, I want more of you. How, listen, has your soul ever been so hungry for God that you said within yourself, I don't care what it takes, I'm going to get more of God. I don't care what it takes, I want more. You see, so many in our westernized world, in the church and in the body of Christ, we settle for just enough of God to get us by. Just enough to make us feel better. Just enough that we can still feel those little Holy Ghost goosebumps come all over us when the Spirit of God begins to move. But can I tell you, there are deeper places in God than just those emotional reactions to a move of the Holy Spirit. 
There is more. There is more that God wants to do in your life. And listen, the provision of God for his children has its roots deep in the Old Testament. In fact, it goes back to the very beginning of, of human history when God created mankind and placed them in the Garden of Eden. And there in the garden, Adam and Eve had everything they needed. Every single thing. They were full. They were in a place of absolute perfection. They had everything they needed. Later on, when Israel needed a leader, what did God do? He raised up Moses. When they needed water in the desert, what did God do? He provided water from a rock. When they needed food for the wilderness wandering, he gave them food in the form of manna. I'm talking about just more. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. You see, when man needed a savior from his sins, God said, I'm going to fix this. Listen, even before we had sinned, God had already known and he said, I'm going to fix this before it ever needs fixing. And he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, on Calvary's cross to die an absolute inhumane death for my sins. I'm talking about God shall provide all of your needs. In addition, there are some fine Christian men and women who have never really learned to trust God completely for their needs. Listen to me. I've never really learned to trust God in those hard times, in those difficult times. You see, it's so easy in our human mind to come up with our own plan B. Just in case, I'm going to have a safety net. Listen, I don't want to be the guy with the safety net. I want to be, be the guy that jumps all in, trust in God. And if, I, if God doesn't come through, then I just die. Because I believe God enough to know that if God says jump, if I see a safety net or I see a landing pad or not, I'm going to jump. Because my God shall supply all of my need according to his riches and glory. In this scripture, the Philippines had seen to it that Paul's needs were met. He was full. He was full. All of his needs were met. Now listen, that doesn't mean that he had an 18,000 foot square house that was air conditioned with a sleep number bed in it and a shower that had 15 shower heads to hit him from every angle. That didn't mean that he was driving to church in his BMW. He was full because he had everything that he needed. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with having all of those other things. As long as we understand those other things are not our source. Amen. In return, because the Philippians had been so generous in sowing into Paul's ministry, because Paul said, listen, you remember from the beginning when I first started in ministry, there was nobody supporting me except for you. There was nobody sending offerings. There was nobody helping me in my journey except you. And now again, you've helped me again. And once and again, you've helped me again. And I am full. And in return, God would meet their needs. They would also be full. You see, they had done their part. And now God was saying he was going to bless their finances. And he was going to bless their resources. And I want to just pull out a couple of thoughts here on this. First, this was very personal for the Apostle Paul. You see, he had sold out his life to God. You remember the story of Paul. You know his history. And many times we can look back on his history and say, oh, shame on him. How could he do that? How can he kill Christians? How can he persecute the church? But let me just remind us that we all have a history. We all have a past. We all have chapters in our lives that we don't want read out loud. 
And yet the Apostle Paul finds himself, after the transformation that God did in his life, he finds himself completely and absolutely sold out to the calling of God on his life. And his relationship with God became so powerful and so connected that he came to the place that he could say, you know what, I am content no matter where I am as long as I have God. I am content. I could be starving beside the road with nothing to eat, and I'm still content because I know who God is, and I know what he's done in my life. I could be in a palace, sleeping on a soft bed, and I'm still content because I know who my God is. Such promises can be claimed by none other than God's own. Someone who wholeheartedly belongs to God. Because we have been bought by him. We belong to him. And he is ours and we are his. And we become his responsibility and he will care for us. The word of God is filled with occasions where God took care of those who loved him. Where God came through for those who called on his name and were faithful to him. Think about it, Christian. He is our God. This same God that Paul said, my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory, is our God still today. He never changes. Paul tells the Philippians that God's provision for them is a promise. See, God... Paul had a personal relationship with God and that relationship with God brought promise and provision into his life through the Philippians church. Because you see, when you are in right standing with God and you're following the calling of God and the anointing of God on your life, many times God will put it on the heart of someone else that you may not even know to sow into your life. You may get a check in the mail that you didn't even know was coming, but God knew and people may even say, you know what, that was just a coincidence. The electric company sent you 152 bucks and 74 cents because you overpaid. No, that wasn't coincidence. That was God making a way where there seemed to be no way. I don't believe in coincidences for the righteous. I believe that God orders the steps of the righteous. So that the provision is there when we need that provision. I'm talking about just more. We don't have to settle for the crumbs that fall from the table. Y'all, we have a seat at the table. Do you hear me? Do you understand that? You are gods. You have a seat at his table. We can't disconnect ourselves and complain about what we feel like God isn't doing in our lives. And then expect him to provide all that we need. And this is a trap that we could so easily fall into. Let me tell you something. Comparison is a trap. And Paul never compared his life to anyone else's. He said, I'm content right where I am, doing right what I'm doing, because this is what God has called me to do. We can look around and see others that have it better than us, even others in the church who have it better than us. Maybe they drive a better vehicle, or maybe they live in a better house. Maybe they have a better job, and we begin to compare, and we be, God, why don't I have that? God, you're not putting anything good in my life. God, the battle is constant. God, this, that, and the other. And God is saying, if you will just level up, and you will be faithful, I will provide all your needs. Listen to me. He said, I will provide all your needs, not all your greeds. Okay? Sometimes we mix up our needs and our wants. And then we get mad at God because he's not giving us our wants. And we think his word isn't true because we're not getting what we want. But when our prayer and our heart, just like Paul, aligns with God, he will meet every single one of our needs. You see, when God is your everything, then he becomes your all-sufficient provider. Church, I want you to understand something. 
Our God is more than enough. Our God is more than enough. I have watched him provide in my life in ways that just blow my mind that I can't even comprehend. Some of you have walked through the exact same things. You've lost jobs, you've lost incomes, you've lost resources, you've lost homes, you've lost vehicles, and yet you stand here today as a trophy of God because God has provided everything that you need. Listen, I want you to know something. When Moses was crossing the Red Sea, that was a provision of God. You see, what God provides for us is not always monetary. It's not always materialistic. Sometimes he provides a way for us where there seems to be no way. When, when God opened up the Red Sea for Moses and they walked across on dry ground, Moses could say, my God has provided a way and he has saved us. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fiery furnace, they could say, my God was in the furnace with me. He was going through it with me and he brought me out of this. When Daniel was in the lion's den, Daniel could say, my God shut the mouths of the lions and he protected me from destruction and he brought me out of that lion's pit. When Lazarus was raised from the dead after having laid in a cold tomb for four days, he could say, my God restored me to life and raised me up. When Jesus touched the leper and made that diseased man clean, that leper could say, my God has healed my body. I'm talking about more church. I'm talking about trusting God for more. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. Can you say with Paul, he is my God? Is there anybody here that our heavenly father is your God? Raise your hand. Come on, all of us. He is my God. And because he is my God, I know that he will provide every single thing that I have need of. In that simple word, my. Paul was letting his readers know that he maintained a personal relationship with God. The word God there, Theos, speaks of the true God, the one true and living God. And this word is synonymous with the Hebrew words Elohim and Jehovah. The word Elohim is God's creating name. It speaks of his power and his preeminence and his creation. Everything that he does, he is Elohim. Every word that comes out of his mouth is creative. And it makes something in us. It creates something in the church and in the body of Christ. So every time the word of God goes forth, it's Elohim and it's changing, it's creating. And it's proving his eternality and his, his always having existed. The word Jehovah is God's relational name. It speaks of his immutable, eternal, and self-sustained existence and how he is, he is one with his people and he connects with us and he provides for us. The term Jehovah Jireh, anybody know what that means? God, my provider. The Lord, my provider. Paul wanted his readers to know that his creating, eternal, immutable, unchanging God could provide every single thing that they need because of their generosity through him. Look, I want two things I want you to glean from this. God can create what is needed. God can create what is needed. Listen, there have been times in my years of ministry through youth pastoring and lead pastoring that the Holy Spirit has spoken something to me and I've questioned, Lord, how? How is that gonna happen? We don't have the resources. We don't have the people. We don't have what it takes. We don't have what we need. And yet every single time I have watched God show up and create something out of nothing. You see, that's what our God does. We look at it and we say, There's vo it's void, it's empty, it's blank, there's nothing. And God speaks a word and all of a sudden, boom, there we go. We have exactly what God has created and spoken. He has unlimited supply an unlimited resource. He can speak into being what is not, and it becomes. 
You see, our God, you can never exhaust his resources. You can never exhaust his capability. Our God is high above the heavens and earth. And listen, if he can speak and the sun and the moon set themselves in place in the universe, and if he can speak and there's light, and he can speak and the whole world comes into existence, what makes us think that he can't speak into our lives and we can watch as he performs miracles and he performs blessings and he performs provision in our lives every single day? Church, we just have to understand God wants more for us. He wants to give more. And when I say give, I'm not just saying money. I'm saying I want your soul to prosper as you prosper. Because you see, God could give you all the money in the world and you could still die and go to hell. And a lot of times the things that we're praying for that we think are needs but are really wants, if God actually gave them to us, they would destroy us. They would crush us. So in his providence and his care, he doesn't put that in our lives. And then we get mad at him because he didn't give us what we wanted. Anybody ever been a spoiled child? <laughs> there have been moments in my life where Jesus had to take me to the woodshed and straighten me out. But my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Jesus Christ. He can create anything. He can bring it into existence for those who are in relationship with him, for those who honor his name, for those who love him. In the midst of our trials and troubles, we start sometimes living with a mindset like we are children of a pauper. But church, I want you to know you are children of a king. You are children of the most high God. Do you get that? Do you understand that? Do you realize who you are? Because the enemy is going to come in and he's going to tell you, you don't have everything you need. God hasn't blessed you. God hasn't given to you. God hasn't been true to his word. The enemy is going to come in and he's going to try to take your mind off of what God has done and how God has met your needs. But don't you let him do that. Look what Paul said. He said, my God shall supply. It was a positive supply. My God shall. He didn't say my God might. Or there's a possibility that God could do it. He said, my God shall supply. See, this was a man who knew the promises of God. And he had watched the promises of God come to pass in his life as he continued faithfully. Because of the source of supply being God, the supply is always certain. If our source is, is anything other than God, then the supply could find, you could find that the supply doesn't measure up. Or sometimes the supply is not there. Sometimes the supply is absent. But when the source is God, the supply will always show up. This text suggests that God is the source of large resources, just more and more. My God shall supply all, not just a few, not just one or two of your needs, but every single need in your life. How many of you here this morning or watching on live stream have a need in your life? I do. I have a need in my life. Every single need that you have, our God is able. As it is empty, it is absolutely impossible to empty out the ocean with just a bucket, so it is impossible to deplete and exhaust all of God's resources. Your needs will never be greater than God's resources. One of the greatest mistakes we make in life is to become narcissistic, 
and self-centered and self-absorbed and, and our mind goes to everything that we need and everything that we want. And it's tragic to live in that place. But as the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Philippians, he, he admonishes them and he commends them for their giving. Thank you. Because God's going to take the little bit that you gave to make me full and he's going to turn that thing around and he's going to supply all of your needs and make you full. You sowed a seed and met one of my needs, God is going to turn it around and meet all of your needs. See, that's the economy of God. I don't know how God can take the measly little 10% I give uh, during the month as my tithe and turn it around and make it more than enough for not only what the church needs, but what I need in my life. But he does it. I don't know how he does it. But there's never been a moment. There's never been an occasion where God has not been faithful in my life. Never, not one single time. Even when, as the song says, even when I don't see him moving, he's still moving. Even when I don't realize that he's moving, he's still moving and he's still working. When God is the center of our lives, those things that appear to be unsatisfied needs will prove not to be needs at all. When God is the center of our life, those things that, that feel like they are, they are unsatisfied needs or needs that haven't been met will prove to not really be needs at all because God will supply all of the need. The word supply there comes from the same Greek word that's translated full in verse 18. And the word is pleru, which means to fill to the fullest. It means to flourish or supply generously, to fill it to the top so there's nothing left. Nothing else will fit in there. There's no room left. In the model prayer, God is pictured as our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And you know, as I prepared this sermon, I thought about just more. I thought, God, help us not to transition into the place where we're just expecting you to pour money and material things into our lives. Yes, when we're faithful, God will bless us in that way sometimes. But please don't walk away from this sermon thinking that if God doesn't fill your bank account, then something's wrong. I don't believe in a prosperity gospel. But I do believe that God prospers his people when we are faithful to him. And when we give our hearts and our lives to him, we understand that he will supply all that we need. And my prayer is, as, as we're talking about just more, is, is God, get me in a position like you had the Apostle Paul to where I can say with, with trueness of heart that no matter where I find myself, if I'm struggling, I'm still content because I know God is providing everything I need. If I'm, if I'm in abundance, I'm okay because I, I'm, I'm not going to let it go to my head. I'm going to realize God is my source and he's providing everything that I need. So no matter what the needs are in our life today, he is our supply. Church, I want you to know when you can't see a solution, my God will supply. When men ignore or don't recognize your need, my God will supply. When it seems like your need has been overlooked, my God will supply. When there is no other source, my God will supply. When you're alone, and unknown, my God will supply. You know, there are times we walk th through things in our lives that we think, is the Lord personally involved in my life? Because I'm really hurting, I'm really struggling right now. Is he available to me right now? Is he available to meet my needs right now? Because Does God just know? And yes, and yes, and yes, and yes. You see, we serve a God who loves you. 
and he gave himself for you. No matter what needs you carry in your heart, in your life, know this, my God shall supply all your needs. I want to ask you to stand with me this morning. What are the needs in your life today? What have you been believing God for in prayer that you haven't seen come to fruition yet? Don't give up. Ask and keep asking. Seek and keep seeking. Knock and keep knocking. And God, at the right time, will meet that need. You just be faithful. You just be faithful. And this morning, I want to pray over your needs. And, and to, to begin this, I want, to, I, want to ask, I want to ask Brother Mike if he would to come and stand in for his father. He was telling me about a need in his father's life this morning and um, a diagnosis of cancer and some breathing issues. And uh, so I want us to, you to stand in for Ken this morning. That the Holy Spirit would touch him. And I want to ask some of the men of our church to gather around Mike today. And if you're here and you have a need in your life, my God shall supply all your need. As we pray over Brother Mike as he stands in for Ken, if you have a need in your life, just step out from where you are. Come join us here and we'll pray with you. We'll believe God with you. We'll take your hand and we will believe God with you for that need. As we pray this morning, would you come if you have a need? Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. 
Bless the name of the Lord. Would you take a moment and just lift your hands with me and worship Him? You may have a need in your life. You may be watching on live stream with a need in your heart. He is here right now. He is here right now to meet that need. He is filling this room. He is filling your home right now to meet your need. He is here. Lord, we trust you today. We lay them all at your feet, Jesus. Every need is in your hand. And we know, we know that you are our Heavenly Father and you love us. And so we will trust you. And when we can't, when we find ourselves lacking trust, when, when we find ourselves on the edge of doubt, Lord, I pray that you would remind us of all the times that you've come through before. Remind us of all the things that you have done in our lives. Remind us of the times that you have already provided. Lord, we bless you today. We love you and we thank you. Hallelujah. 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 Church, we're going to come to the table of the Lord this morning and receive communion. As we do, if you will come forward and receive the elements of communion, uh, we will uh, that you take them back to your seat. Uh, we have the prepackaged. We also have the traditional. So whichever you desire is, is fine. But uh, prepare your hearts this morning as we come to the table of the Lord. Because we don't do this just as a ritual. We do this in remembrance of Jesus Christ and the price he paid on Calvary for us. It was a big price. There's nothing more he could have done to buy our salvation. And once and for all, he set us free from sin. Did you know we don't have to be in bondage to sin anymore because of what Jesus Christ did on Calvary? I'm so thankful for that. I'm so thankful for that today. And as I prepare to uh, distribute the elements. If you would come, we'll start over here on my right and your left.
this morning as we take the bread. We acknowledge this as the body of Christ, his body that was beaten for us, his body that was broken for us. When they nailed him on that cross, it was for you and for me. We do this in remembrance of him because I don't ever want to forget or take it for granted the sacrifice he made for me. It's absolutely overwhelming to think that he would consider me valuable enough to lay down his life, to be brutalized, to be broken for me. Who am I? And yet he did gladly and freely. So today we acknowledge and we remember, we remember the sacrifice he made for us. As we bless this bread, we break it and we partake. Would you partake this morning? And he took the cup as he sat with his disciples, acknowledging that this cup represented a new covenant in his blood. It would do away with all of the other sacrifices. They were no longer necessary. We know the word of God says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So it was necessary for the blood of Jesus to be poured out from his body. And the really amazing thing is, it poured out from his body on that cross, but it went all through time and eternity, all through history and future to us today. His blood still flows. His blood is still powerful. His blood is still changing lives every single day. It washes away our sins sanctifies our soul. Would you partake of the cup this morning? Now, would you just take a moment and worship the Lord just in your own way. Spend some time with Him. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I don't deserve what you did for me. I don't deserve how you gave your life for me. But I'm most so glad you did. Lord, there's nothing I could ever do to pay you back. And it's, I'm glad because you don't require that. All you want is my heart. And that I freely give. Lord, we remember your sacrifice today and we honor your sacrifice for it has changed our lives. It's changed our future. It's changed our destiny. It's changed our eternal life. Lord, we're so thankful today. We bless your holy name. And everyone said, amen and amen. God bless you today. I hope that you walk in the favor and the blessing of the Holy Spirit. Take care.
fast and try to figure out that rhythm. started unplugging everything. <laughs> and hey, he went like this. Which one? Dad. Oh, he, was, he was like, back in the in the amp room, I was like, you know what any of this stuff goes to? He, I was like, <laughs> he's like. I mean, look at everything is. And he had 40, or he had 20 something channels yeah. plugged in. Yeah. And I said, I said, last this. I mean, cordless mic yet. The four and then the dwarves, right? He said, yeah. Because that one, that shore is mine. Okay. So that's why this one's over here. Got it. I should try. One, two, three, four. <laughs> 